that emerge in the course of our engagement. And we want to thank so much the diverse industry sector players who have sponsored the expo and at the same time sponsored this segment of quality engagement that we are going to have. To get us underway on day one was a great presentation by a senior officer at the National Environment Management Authority on the role of NEMA in the regulation of packaging in the bakery industry. So we are the principal instrument of government when it comes to implementing all policies relating to the environment in Kenya. That is briefly what we are. So how do we do that coordination and supervision? Of course we have a number of legislation that uh, we use. The very first one that is relevant to you is what we call the environmental impact assessment and audit regulations because if you want to put up a plant you know you need to first of all conduct an environmental impact assessment so we know the negative impacts of course plus the positive but our interest is usually there the negatives so you predict what impacts there will be from your operations and when you start the implementation you need to do an environmental audit so you actually see how those impacts are manifesting. And then of course in all your operations you generate waste from plastics, from organic waste, from all manner of waste including effluent. So you need to manage that waste, you need to manage the effluent that is the wastewater. And then another one that is of a huge relevance to you is that your products need to be packaged and a number of them are done in plastic packaging. So the plastic packaging control becomes relevant. In fact, it is the main thing that I know you want to talk about today. So we jump there straight. So in 2017, through a Gazette notice, the CS responsible for environment banned the use, you can see what I've highlighted, the use, the manufacture, and the importation of all, underline all, all plastic bags used for commercial and household packaging and they were defined as the carrier bags and the flat bags that are either reinforced with, with what we call the gases or whether they have handles or not. So what does that mean? That all these bags we are using were banned come August of 2017 because it was six months from February. Yes, that is what it meant. But then we all live to eat and we all eat to, to live. So we realized if we do not package these products, perhaps there would be a problem, either uh, a public health related problem or other related problems. So the Bakery Association or the Bakers Association, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, other stakeholders and of course NEMA sat down and said, what do we do? We have to eat. So we said, okay, let us come up with a clearance process as we look for other alternative packaging. So the big question that I want to ask you today is, from 2018, now we are in 2023, do we actually have viable alternatives to the plastic packaging? Because that wasn't us that promised it was you. Now you need to, it's the moment of truth. We don't want to put a lie detector. We just want you to comfortably tell us, based on your research up to now, are there viable alternatives to plastic packaging for your products? Up next after Neymar was the general manager of Bakel's East Africa, Eric Muragori, who did an extensive presentation on bakery operations efficiency. So the difference between quality control and quality assurance, these two terms actually, sometimes they use interchangeably interchange within the organization. Quality assurance, I'll say, is becoming more proactive, is becoming more focused on prevention of defects. So you are monitoring step by step within your organization, meaning that you know the, you, you know the quality of your raw materials, you know the COAs, 
you are checking the specs of your raw materials. You are checking the process step by step until the end of the finished product. While as quality control, you focus on identification of such defects. So when CAPS comes to your organization, Kenya Bureau of Standards are doing quality control. They are just picking a sample to go and verify whether it's meeting the requirements. When your lab within your organization is picking a final product, they are checking whether the product is meeting the final, the, the, the specs. So quality assurance is what I'll emphasize that bakers need to focus on. Please monitor your process. Become proactive. Check each stage of your process. And actually, you won't be surprised. So realize that those people who focus on quality control are the ones who are surprised and ask themselves what happened. The bread did not rise. What happened? Those people actually are focusing on quality control. But if you focus on quality assurance, you check the quality of flour, you check the quality of your yeast, you check on all parameters of your oven, so you won't be surprised. So you won't ask what happened. And that defines now, if you can see that within a quality system, quality assurance takes a big role or takes a big percentage of your work. In terms of bakery operations, most majority of the operations within bakery uh, or focuses on several aspects or several activities. The first thing you realize is that you have to have what you call a production planning. What is your planning for the week? What is your planning for the day? And what is your focus? Sometimes as suppliers of ingredients, we usually face challenges. Because someone tells me, I need yeast and now I have nothing to use. It tells you those people are not doing, they are focusing, they are not doing their production planning. And actually it's like you keep on firefighting to make sure the delivery is on time. And remember, they'll perceive you and they'll base your quality of delivery based on the delivery time. You can have low materials and ingredients supply, which I'll focus on later. And then you have production management. Then engineering and maintenance is a very key parameter to make sure that you deliver a quality product. When do you service your uh, ovens? Do you have a service schedule for your ovens? Do you have spares ready for your ovens? Or do you buy the spare when the oven has broken down? Do you calibrate your oven? Meaning that the temperature is showing on the board. Is it the same temperature that is inside the oven? So it's good to calibrate. The personnel management, your staff, do they have medical examination? Are they renewed? Those are the, some of the aspects. Do, are they in uniform? Are they covering their hair to avoid any physical uh, contaminants to the product? Continuous improvement. Are you identifying areas of improvement within your bakery? Is it the floor? Is it the roof? Is it the walls? Quality assurance, which I've mentioned there. Then there's a plant sanitation, which is very key in terms of sanitation. How are you handling your waste management? How are you uh, handling your pest control? So that comes to the sanitation of the plant. In terms of the overall uh, operations, which is the plant economics control, is you, are you able to do your costing well to determine whether bakery is profitable? Then in terms of support, do you have an L&D team? that is focusing on developing new products because the industry is very competitive. So those are some of the operations that can interfere with your quality product that you want to deliver to your consumers. I said I'll focus on low materials. And low materials, the reason why I want to focus on low materials is because it is the first item that you engage yourself in. Remember garbage in, garbage out. Meaning that you have to establish ingredient specifications for each product that you are receiving in your bakery. Do you have specifications? Do you have COA? Do you receive products with COAs? Sometimes people get surprised when they get the baker's flour, but they don't know actually the type of baker's flour they're getting. They just receive the flour with the invoice, but they don't even know the gluten in that, the type of, the quality of gluten in that flour. They don't even know the development time of that flour. But since they have set their machine that is three minutes slow speed, four minutes high speed, possibly the kind of flour you received, the, weak, the gluten is weaker. So you, let, you end up messing your gluten, and when you now put the bread for proofing, it starts collapsing. Because you are not understanding the key low material or the key ingredients you have in your bakery. So it's very important to you, always when you receive your flour, ask for a COA. 
it will tell you on how to set your equipment. Next to take the stage was Esten Giri, who is a technical application specialist at Moulin Kemi. Her presentation shed light on baking basics in bread making. Bread is a very important staple food in our community. Like the first thing everyone goes for is bread in the morning. Bread and margarine, bread and butter, bread and jam. And it's very important to know the little key points that you need to be able to make a proper uh, loaf. So as we all know, the main ingredients in the bread baking, we, to get a good bread, you more or less need five ingredients. But the most important one, as we all know, is the flour. So you must make sure you have good quality flour. It's very important because it plays a very significant role. Then the second one is yeast. So yeast is also very good, uh, is also a very important um, ingredient in the baking of bread because yeast is what helps your bread raise. So as it was mentioned earlier, if you don't have good quality yeast, you will definitely not have a good quality bread. Then we also have salt. Salt is also very, very important in bread making. Whether you use a lot or very little, it is very, very important because it helps in the taste and improving the flavor and also helps in glutening, in strengthening the gluten network. For example, if you want to do a trial, you can, when you go home, if you're a bread baker, you can try and make a dough with salt and one without salt you will see a very, very big difference. So salt is also very important. And mostly, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, those who are bread bakers here, in Kenya we use between one and 1.5% 1 of, of uh, salt, which is calculated based on the weight of your flour. So all these other ingredients, flour being the main ingredient, everything else is calculated based on the weight of the flour. So our fourth most important ingredient is uh, water. Water is what helps in all the binding, binding of all the ingredients, and it also helps in freshness and the softness. So if you have a, have a very hard dough, you will not have, have a very good breadcrumb structure. And if you have a very soft dough, um, you will have a very open crumb uh, structure in your bread. Then we also have sugar, for those who like sugar in their bread. Sugar is also an important ingredient, although some people, like the French baguettes, do not need salt, the crusty rolls, no need sugar, sorry. So sugar also helps in the um, fermentation, and then it's also used, yeast, yeast is also, yeast and sugar work together, so yeast helps, um, is a food, sugar is food for the yeasts. Um, then we also have fat, Fat also helps in the in, in increasing of the extensibility, also it helps in the softness, and it also helps in the extension of shelf life of your baked products. We have three ways you can mix your dough. So there's a short mixing time, there's a normal mixing time, and there's an over kneading. So when you over knead, when you, sh when you don't mix your dough in the proper, during the proper mixing time, so when the mixing time is too short, you have very many things that can go wrong. So your dough becomes very firm, and then you have very short gluten. So if you're doing your gluten test, which is the window method, you find that you, your dough breaks before it even stretches. Then you get that your bread volume will be very low because the gluten will be very tight, thus your bread will not rise properly. Then we have, if you need your dough for too long, there'll be very, very good extensibility, that for sure you will get. But then your gluten network will be destroyed. Then the dough will be very sticky. You may have had the proper recipe of, uh, of your bread, but then if you over mix it, your dough becomes very sticky. And then now you'll notice your water will start being released from the dough. So that's why the, water, the dough looks very sticky and uh, a bit watery. Then we have the perfect dough kneading time. So if you need your dough, the perfect way, at the perfect time, you get your gluten formed properly. So your yeast produces proper gas and all those processes that start. Esther's presentation evoked a lot of great thoughts during the summit, as was Bakel's East Africa's Josh Ochiing's presentation, which was largely around the quality of flour. Uh, there are varieties of, uh, a number of varieties of wheat grain, and the wheat grain that is used to mill a particular flour 
will inform the quality of, of that flour. So that is very important to know. And the wheat, the, the wheat, wheat flour quality is mostly informed by whether the type of wheat that is, that is milled. There are basically two categories of wheat grain. We either have wheat hard or we have soft wheat. So depending on which one is milled, then you'll be able to have wheat that is meant for pastry or uh, products like uh, the all-purpose uh, products like uh, our mandazis, our chapatis. And uh, if the millers milled hard wheat, then that particular wheat will also be used for particular products like our bread, for example. What is it that informs the type of whether the wheat flour is soft or hard? It is the protein content. Protein content is very important and uh, depending on the amount or the quality of protein or gluten in our wheat, then we can classify wheat as either soft or, or hard. And, and for, the, for, the, for the baker, it is important that you know, as my colleague had mentioned earlier, that you know the kind of flour that you're handling at any given time. What is the amount of protein that you have? What is the amount of gluten that is in your flour? Flour is very important because flour makes up of a huge amount of, uh, out of the, the, the ingredients that you're using for bakery, flour is the most, uh, occupies the largest percentage. So flour is very important and important that we know that. Wheat flour quality includes all measurables or quantify, quantifiable parameters that are related to the wheat or any cereal flour used to produce baked goods. In the baking industry, flour quality uh, is normally evaluated or checked on a daily basis. And uh, we strongly advise that the bakery industry also invest on a mechanism uh, through which they can be able to confirm the, the, the quality of flour that they are having so that they can also invest in the laboratories. Uh, some that do not have can send their flour for testing in other commercial labs so that they can be able to confirm some of these parameters. And these parameters are categorized into basically about four uh, parameters. That is, we have the physiochemical characteristics like the protein content I was mentioning to you earlier, the gluten content, the falling numbers, the moisture contents, and even the enzymatic activities in the flour. We could also classify, we could also, the, the, the other parameter is uh, rheological uh, properties. This includes the way your flour mixes. Is it mixing easy? Does your flour resist? For example, for people who are home bakers who are using, who are doing uh, uh, chapatis or mandazis, when you are rolling it, does it roll out easily or it is resisting? Uh, elasticity and extensibility, all these are what? Are rheological properties. You need to set up a system. As I mentioned, the quality assurance systems and quality control in place so that your flour uh, is, is fit for consumption. Uh, it does not have uh, uh, yeast and mold when tested above the level that are not recommended. It doesn't have salmonella, the E. coli and, and, and the rest. Uh, the baker concern is that if I bake today with this flour, will I get the same loaf of bread tomorrow? They don't want to have a good loaf today and tomorrow they don't have a good loaf. Today, the loaf is proofing well. In the afternoon, the, 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 the dough is, uh, or the, the loaf is collapsing. Baker requires consistency. The consistency helps the baker in time management, in ensuring that the customers also get quality, consistent quality product. So the only way the, 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 the baker can ensure that is by be, be able to get consistent flour quality. That is very important. So the quality of flour intended for specific baked goods, production can be modified and improved by using uh, some en enzymes. So the question is, why is it that it is not possible for millers to give you quality or consistent flour quality? Uh, it, is, it, it, it is because they do not get consistent wheat grain. The wheat grain that we are milling consistently change and therefore they have a challenge in doing that. But I'm saying because of the existence of companies like Beckels and, and even our colleagues Mulenkemi, we are able to bring that flour into a, 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 into a situation that can be able to give you consistent uh, flour quality. And with those quality presentations, the audience was ripe for a panel discussion. Day one featured two panel discussion sessions, which our team documented for your benefit. We are able, as fortificants and treatment partners, we are able to work with millers 
using technology to be able to identify the quality of the flour that you have and if your quality is not standard and it's not good enough to be used in the bakery, we are able to give you solutions and treatments to put in your flour to be able to improve that. Like for example, if you're a bread, uh, bread baker, you need a flour that has got high protein. So when you have a flour that has got high protein, you're able to have good extensibility and strong bread. So for you to gain to achieve that with this flour that you've been given, there's some things that you may need to add to improve that quality. Um, then also even for chapati, some of you complain, some of the chapati, mama chapati complain, if you roll your chapati, your chapati rolls back to you. So we have the technology to be able to check into your flour and be able to tell your flour needs this and this and this improvement. So that's where technology comes in. Um, when it comes to water absorption, it all ends up with the quality of your flour. So if you have a flour that has got um, you will always have to test your flour before you decide what amount of, let me just go back, you'll always have to test your flour depending on them to check the amount of water that you need to add into your flour. So if your flour, for example, if you get your flour from a meal and it's still fresh, you find that flour that has been, that has been produced today and the flour that is produced seven days later have a difference. So the absorption in the flour that is a bit older is better. So it's always nice to look at your manufacturing date. So if your flour is still fresh, you need to look for flour that has already matured so that you can be able to get a flour that will absorb more water. In terms of food safety, it is the processes that actually you engage yourself within a food processing sector to actually prevent any defect that can lead to injury or can lead to illness when that uh, final produced pro uh, product is consumed by the consumer. And again, I put a caveat, when it is used for the intended use. Because if you don't use it for the intended use, then it can cause injury. Because for example, we all know alcohol, it is produced for an intended use. But the moment you misuse alcohol then, it will cause injury, it can even lead to death. So in terms of uh, the food safety then aspects, one of the things all of us must understand in our bakery, we must adopt what is called GMP. Simple, GMP, Good Manufacturing Practices. There are almost eight of them, and you must identify them within your bakery. Number one is the personnel, for instance. The personnel, are they well trained? Are they well groomed in terms of Hygiene, uh, do you have a hygiene policy? Do you have a hygiene code? The second thing is more of the establishment. How is your facility? How are you taking care of your facility? Because we, know, we all know that in some baking we are using trolleys that end up developing potholes within the floor. What are you doing to your floor? To your floor? Remember also the trolley can cause an accident. The other aspect is that equipment and maintenance as a that GMP. Are you maintaining your equipment? Are you servicing your equipment? Are you having a service schedule? The fourth GMP, do you have a pest control mechanism within your facility? The other one is the raw materials. Are you, do you have a method of receipt of your raw material, acceptance and rejection? And then the other thing is the warehousing, distribution, cleanliness. For them that are doing bread, eh? It is, it is very important that, uh, that we, we, we check the, co the, the temperature of the water that we are using for bread, bread uh, uh, baking, because that influences, will influence greatly the yield that you get. I've, I work closely with most bakeries and I can assure you that uh, most of the medium and small scale bakers have not invested in uh, chill, chillers or in mechanism to be able to chill, cool, cool down their water. So they basically use the room temperature water, which then denies you about one or two percent of what you'd have gotten. So when you talk about yield optimization, please, cold water or water, the temperature water you're using comes in handy. Before you even talk about, in addition to the quality of the flour that you're using and the recipe and many, many of those. So make sure that the water that you are using is at the temperature which is, uh, which is acceptable. 
And that the water temperature is not just helping you on the yield, but it also helps you in controlling your baking process so that it doesn't move so fast ahead of you, so that everything happens at the right time and thereby giving you the right product. Uh, what are you trying to tell us? Do you feel that we should ditch traditional baking? No, we, we can, uh, we can we, we, I think we need to have, we can have an hybrid system. There are good things about traditional baking and there are some that are not good that can be dropped and then we, we have an hybrid system whereby we embrace the good that uh, the modern baking has brought in and, uh, and, and also maybe maintain the good that uh, the, the traditional baking has done. For example, traditional baking, uh, traditionally you are not using uh, yeast as a leavening agent for bread. Uh, probably they used to bake bread, they just need it and leave it there to prove using the natural yeast which is existing. But we are saying, if you do that, then you want to wait, you want to waste time because you will wait for long before the bread proofs and yet you need to get certain certain amount of production per day. So we are saying, why don't you drop that and embrace use yeast? For example, so that your process can be quickened and be able to get your uh, enough the production. So in so doing, then you'll be able to embrace the good or both the traditional, but you're also embracing the good part of the tradition. So in, to answer your question is, uh, the baker, depending on your system, you need to look at your system and be able to say, what is it that I can bring in, which is modern, that will be able to help my process, to enhance the quality of my products, to enhance the process so that I can be able to produce a lot of uh, products, but at the same time be able to maintain the flavor, the traditional flavor that uh, is known for my products. My question really goes to Esther and uh, Mr. Eric. It's uh, about regarding the chemicals that are used in the process of uh, bread baking. Uh, we understand that some chemicals are not good for, for human consumption. That's why recently we have heard that uh, uh, food which are canned, which are canned. I'm, I'm not sure I'm using the correct word. Like the beans, like the fish, which are which are which are which are canned, are normally uh, added with chemicals to make its life longer. Yani it stays for long. Quite my question is, uh, in the process of bread baking, do you add any chemicals in the bread that may endanger the, the consumer's health? That's my only question. Thank you. Now, the, the first thing I'll start by correction. Uh, we don't call them chemicals because the word, when I use the word chemical, I'll scare the consumer. So I'll use the word food additives. And food additives are passed through a body that actually monitors the effect on human over a period of time. And they are passed through what we call generally recognized as safe. The acronym is GRASS and they pass through FDA, they are given code, so you see like a product written preserved with the EN 110, those are the codes that have been passed, and even KEBS is a body, is, is a member of that body. So all those are passed through a body, which now passes them as generally recognized as safe. The only thing we do as manufacturers is misuse them. So the moment you misuse them, then it will cause harm. What do I mean by misuse? You are told, use 10 parts per million. Then, because you want your bread to be longer on the shelf, you want to use calcium carbonate, a calcium propionate double. Then you are misusing the, the food additives. Uh, thank you, Eric. I think our time is up. Indeed, there's quite a lot that is happening in packaging, but at the same time, how we are disposing our packages and why indeed we also package. We package for purposes of brand identity. We package uh, at the same time following certain compliance or guidelines that have been set by the authorities. And at the same time, we package so that we can be able to appeal indeed very well to the consumers uh, within, within the industry. But all this in, in mind, uh, there are challenges that we are experiencing, and not only challenges, uh, there are issues that we are able to address uh, ultimately. 
I'll call upon, first of all, one who produces some of the packages within the uh, industry and has been very, very vibrant uh, for years to introduce herself and also tell us what the experience has been in relation to this topical issue. Ms. Raki, please. So, good afternoon. Um, I'm Raki Chandaria, the sales director at Paper Bags Limited. Um, for packing things like bread, uh, paper is not ideal just because of the long shelf life you want for bread to, you know, to remain fresh and soft on the shelves. Uh, however, we're always trying to uh, improve in terms of our paper or coated papers and, and see how we can offer something better for, for bread packaging. Um, the only, the, there's still challenges like uh, we mainly use paper, we use some, some film to make window bags like if, you've, uh, if you shop at Carrefour and if you buy bread from their bakery, uh, the, the bags that are used for their bread are made by us. Uh, but again, that is a bread that will be on the shelf for a couple of days. It's not your uh, Broadway or your Elliot's which is there for longer. And so it's, it's still, uh, I think, it, it's, it's always going to be the case where bread is best packaged in plastic. But I feel that uh, going forward, if we're going to continue using plastic, we need to ensure that we're recycling that somehow and, and not disposing it off in a, in a bad way, just disposing it correctly. Absolutely. Uh, and she has actually thrown in some insights based on what is happening as far as challenges is concerned and more or less inkling towards also giving a solution in regards to recycling. I cannot actually waste any more opportunity than to introduce again Beldina just to chime into this as she introduces herself further. Uh, hello, yeah, my name is Beldina uh, Kirito, CEO and founder of Beldina Delicacies, a bakery that uh, is located in Kikuyu town. We bake cakes for all locations and we also train we offer apprenticeship to upcoming bakers, especially uh, those who want to start small or those who cannot afford to pay a lot of fees to their colleges. So one of the areas that we train bakers is how to bake bread, cupcakes, cookies, mandazis. And now after the training, the question is now how do we package our materials? Because we all know, the bakers here, we all know how difficult it is, uh, the process of getting cabs approval, NEMA approval, or uh, able to afford the minimum order MOQ. They have, I believe you have MOQ. MOQ yeah? yeah, so that is a very big challenge, especially to upcoming bakers and low income earners. So now our question today is to NEMA and cabs. How can you make it? easy for upcoming bakers, for small bakers, the person who has a capital of even 10,000. Yeah, there are people, they say, I have 10,000 between me and that is all I have to do the training, to start to buy the um, equi equipment I need, and for that matter, at the charcoal ovens, and uh, to also buy the ingredients, yeah? And now the packaging, actually, a budget, like uh, myself, I tried asking for a budget of MOQ, uh, the minimum order of uh, packing bags for the cupcakes. I was told a minimum, I have to pay like, I was given a quote of 900,000. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and that 900,000 does not include uh, the cabs, does not include um, NEMA fees and all that. So it's like um, the industry is left for just the big giants. Now our question is to the small bakers, starting bakers. Probably we can get a solution here today. Nema Kebs unfortunately is not here today. How are we, how can we be helped as small bakers to break through in the industry without so much struggles? Okay, rightly put and more so with a question towards our immediate next speaker who will introduce himself and tell us Will small bakers ever start? There's a record I need to set straight from the very beginning. 
Our association with, uh, or our interaction with uh, the bakers is like that of a husband and a wife. And probably we are the wife, the bakers are the husband. <laughs> but our husband here has a drinking problem, which is plastics. And we are saying, please reduce your drinking so that we can live happily. There are several other things you can drink, yes. You can do juice, you can do milk, you can do zero alcohol. And we shall prosper. And of course you're saying, yeah, yeah, I understand you, my dear, we will do this. But then again, you hide and increase your drinking. And you come home and saying, I'm not drunk. <laughs> that is a problem we have to address today, in a nutshell. I would like to make a follow-up question. Now that you are the wives yes. within, within, within the sector, and you ought to manage this house called environment more effectively. Uh, do you, have you foreseen any um, alternative that you could also propose uh, to the market? The drinking problem has persisted. What yeah. are we now saying? Absolutely. That was a question I posed earlier. And yes. that answer has to come from you. The options exist. Why are they not being adopted? There is something you are not telling us. Uh, yes, uh, certainly we cannot sustain the momentum of lamenting. This is uh, a discourse that should have clear outcomes at the end of the day. We've been looking into getting um, biodegradable film, so importing biodegradable film or importing um, a paper which has a coating which is biodegradable, which in, especially in Europe, they, they use it for, for bread and it, the shelf life is the same as a plastic bag. Um, the only thing with, with those uh, biodegradable items, um, the cost is a lot higher. Uh, and when we're looking at our, just our generic bread being sold for, you know, whatever it is, 50 shillings maybe, um, your cost of packaging will be quite substantial in terms of increase. So, you know, we, we, we can import, but is everyone going to adopt that solution? Probably not, just because of the cost factor. And then again, here we would, we would seek advice or seek help from, from the government in, in reducing um, taxis and reducing levies for, for paper because for currently for plastics the import duties or the taxes are very low compared to paper and yet we're trying to ban plastics so it you know to, to, to me it doesn't tie in. In the meantime as we try to get a solution I can I advocate for reuse recycling and I think a policy can be put in place whereby we do serious campaigns. Nowadays, the power of social media, the power of uh, the, even the traditional media, especially for those people in rural area, whereby, yes, let's, in the meantime, as we wait to get a permanent solution, let's use these uh, bags and let's advocate, highly do campaigns for recycle and reuse it. Like, for example, we can have, like, for me, if I'm producing bread and, uh, or a cupcakes, I, where I'm supplying or my clients, I tell them the policy is you bring the bag. Anytime I'm supplying, let's say, a supermarket, before I deliver, let me have the bag, the returns. Day two of the summit was equally eventful. Conference delegates were treated to topics that carried great insights on how they could make their baking businesses successful. On the stage to commence the second day was Sumac Microfinance Bank Limited to educate the delegates on the requirements for a functional relationship with financial institutions. As a baker, you have your company. Do you have the, the right management structure? What do I mean by this? Are you in a position where, if you're a small baker, because in this, in this expo we have small bakers and big bakers. As small bakers, I, have you separated your business from your household? And if you have, do you, for big bakers, do you have the right team in terms of your structures? 
Why is this important? Because the separation and having a, a great team brings in the professionalism and of course will increase the quality of your, of your product. And with this, if a financial institution is looking at you as a baker and you'd want to, uh, to, to access financing, they'd want to know, how is this business managed? Is the business just together like, you know, you're, are you baking for tea at home or have you separated very well? And as a big baker or an advanced baker, do you have the right tea? in terms of operations, in terms of sales, in terms of even the chefs who are helping you bake. And what is the continuity? For example, um, for Patrick here, if you're not at work today, you're here today, is, is there work going on at your bakery? Or does it, has it come to a stop? Okay? And for the rest of the bakers who are here, if you're not the one who's baking, what is happening? It means if you are the key person and your business cannot go on without you being there, then that in itself is a risk. Okay? Why? Because something can happen to you. It means there's no business continuity. Therefore, for financial institutions, when they are looking at your businesses, they'd like to see that aspect of, of business continuity that is what we mean by what are your management structures secondly let's look at record keeping how do you keep your records as a baker who's a, who's in business or as a baker who's an entrepreneur yeah this record keeping is very important because it brings history to how you've been performing your business so when a financial institution is looking at advancing credit facilities to you those are some of the issues they, uh, those are some of the records they're going to ask for do you keep records they will ask where do you buy your products from where are those records where do you sell do you give out invoices do you give out a receipt something as basic as a receipt is very important it it verifies the information that you're going to give or verifies information that is not in your bank statement and then the other question is, what is, how is your credit health? You're an entrepreneur. How do you handle your debts? Do you pay your debts? Do you pay your debts? If a supplier gives you credit, are you faithful enough to pay? If a bank gives you credit, are you faithful enough to pay back now what has been happening in the in this industry we have a lot of small and medium enterprises um, who've been listed with CRB that for now it's not a bad thing but it's an opportunity for us to start a journey where we we build a positive credit health start off by clearing some of these loans make sure when you're given a credit facility you pay even in the mobile by the digital financial providers why it gives you a higher chance to be given financial uh, to have financial access from any financial institution whatsoever Juan Gico Lucia Mugo the founder of Baker's Club and a seasoned expert in the field was invited to speak at the Baker's Summit about her journey in the bakery industry and her recent experience at the Bakery and Pastry Expo, and for sure, she didn't disappoint. When I was told that uh, I was requested whether I can talk about my journey, the first thing that came to my mind was, where do I start, right? And um, I'm humbled to be sharing my story with you today because um, it's been quite a story. I started baking in um, 2014, October actually, so I can tell you because I remember very well that September my son had a birthday and we got a cake from somewhere and I didn't like it, right? And then um, one month later, I remembered that I had done some home science somewhere in high school. So I started putting things together in my kitchen 
and I realized, okay, this is something that I, I love doing, okay? I was working somewhere, I've been having a day job, doing something that is totally different from baking, but somehow my passion for baking won me over. I realized that there's so much more that um, you need to learn, actually. So like uh, Eva has said, yes, you will be required to invest a lot in your equipment, in, your, in, the, run, in the running of your business, but there's also what we call the software, the insight, all right? So I started, you know, trying uh, to advance my skills, signing up for trainings here and there. And uh, one of the challenges that I was having as a beginner was access to, um, to the things that we require as a baker. To, where do I get packaging from? What is the right thing to use for this? So the few bakers who I knew at that time, I would call them and text them and ask, I'm looking for this thing, so where do I get it? So a thought came that, how, how about, I mean, where are all these bakers? I mean, you go to a function, you go to an event, you go to a wedding, cake, or a wedding and there's a whole big cake there. So where are all these bakers? Do they struggle like I do? So that's when I, I started the Bakers Club. So I thought, let me do a group for everyone in the baking industry. Somewhere, a space where we can come together and network and interact. I am looking for this and somebody will say I am selling it, see? So I started Baker's Club in uh, 2015, February 2015, and uh, it, it runs on Facebook, and we've grown and grown and grown to a very big number. We are now at uh, 445,000 people. And one magic thing that happened is the access to everything that a baker needs. So you'll find somebody does a post, I am looking for boxes and boards, and there's someone there very fast answering that uh, you can get from me and this is my contact or we are here. So you see, it was way easier. And we have seen uh, businesses just, you know, blossom from just I, I supply from some place to owning a big store somewhere. Yeah. Now we're even having things delivered to the comfort of our business that you can get online and order things. And that is where all the networking has come from. So first, you must, you must have that in you that this is something that I want to do. Because truth be told, baking is not easy. It is not easy. Working on a cake for hours, I am sure you have seen bakers wear flat shoes, <laughs> very comfortable shoes, because you're on your feet for hours. So it will require a lot of dedication from you. You have to have that drive in you to be able to endure. It is a journey, okay? Every day, every day you learn something new <laughs> and things won't work all the time. There will be long nights, there will be usikusako. Ask a baker about usikusako, they'll tell you what usikusako is. But the one thing that will keep you going is the end product that you want to bring on your table. It is so fulfilling. It is very fulfilling as a baker to have an idea and bring it to life that you're able to see that I sketched this from maybe uh, my client's description of their event and this is what has come to life, okay? Because um, baking is, not a, is, is, is actually an expensive venture to start. When you look at the equipment around, equipment that is going to give you, you know, good um, yield, whatever, if you, if you have like a lot of orders, you'll be able to service them and deliver. Then it means you will need a lot of equipment, you will need to invest in your skill, and these trainings don't come cheap. So if you, are, if you have the advantage of taking some time to first acquire these things pole pole to pole pole to one item, after another. So over the seven years that I had done baking on the side, I had bought equipment, I had gone for some, you know, trainings that had taken me way higher, and I had seen where the baking industry is, and I had made a decision that this is where I want to plug in. So when I left, I set up a training center for beginners. I have a passion for beginners. So yes, you will do things and they will work, but sometimes you also, if you want to be regarded as a professional. If you want to go far, then you have to do it right, okay? Get your act together, get your records together, get your management together, get your software 
which is now you and the skills that you have and the people around you also who work with you. Package yourself as a professional business if you want to gain from uh, what you are doing. Teresa Okal, who is the sales manager at Cake City Limited, shared very concrete and inspiring thoughts on how a bakery business can build a strong brand. Here are some of the highlights of her presentation. These are my ingredients. They can be more than this, but I settled on, five, on six. Quality, brand positioning, consistency, community development, creativity and innovation. We have marketing on this. My point is do not limit, do not go down, do not compromise on quality of the ingredients you're going to use in preparing your cake. Do not totally, if you are looking at a good cake, just go to the best florist you know. If it is a customized cake and you need flowers, fresh flowers for it, go to the best florist you know. If you are looking at flour, go to the, go to the best brands or what you define as quality. When you're selling something like a cake, which somebody can do without, which I'm not claiming that we need to do without, but you need to invest in customer service, customer experience. Call these clients and ask them, I sold a cake to you, did you like it? Well, how was it? What do you think that I need to improve on it? Um, what can I do better next time? Sell the convenience bit. If somebody can easily call, get a lovely lady or man speaking over the phone and telling, and telling them you can get a cake within 15 minutes, which flavor would you like? Where would you like us to deliver the cake then? I believe you would go for that rather than you walking to a body, um, going to, through expenses of traveling, going to a shop and buying cake. Brand positioning is a process of getting your brand out there and establishing. It is something worth thinking about by clients. We all package our cakes and deliver, deliver the cakes to, to people. Now, it's, in, it's not a matter of what you do, but rather how you do it. As much as you've packaged it, did you, uh, have you written a message for the client, uh, like a small card? Is your packaging branded? Does it have your color logos? Does it have something, something that even after we've eaten the cake, when somebody sees this box in a dustbin, they'll be like, no, I know this brand. I know it. I'm familiar with it. Consistency. It allows your customer to know exactly what to expect every time they purchase your product. Your client came today, ordered a black forest from you. The next day, the probability of that client ordering the same, same cake from you the next day is high. Then after there, there, there is where they develop this trust in your brand. They're like, if I tasted that black forest from this company and it was nice, then I, I would like to assume that the, their cookies are, good, are equally good. Or let me try this pina colada. Let me try this, um, let me try this custom cake. Uh, and then for, once your consistency, you, once you make the same cake, I'm not talking about, uh, I'm saying the same cake with consistency, quality products, and what people liked the first time is what they got the second time. They'll obviously refer clients to you. And when they refer clients to you, it's more business for you. Now with marketing, the main purpose of marketing is to create awareness. After creating awareness, you would like um, it to generate traffic to your, to your brand. After it has generated traffic to your brand, it needs to increase sales. If it does not, you'll feel bad about the whole situation, but the main purposes of, purpose of marketing is to increase sales. After it has increased sales, you'll get repeat clients. 
because people trusted your products and they've seen consist consistency and you are a brand that they would like to associate with. Delegates also had a front seat understanding of quality standards that define baking business, as was ably presented by Nelly, who is a trade officer at the Kenya Bureau of Standards. The first one is the standardization mark. It is a mandatory mark for all products that are sold in Kenya, and it's also for locally manufactured goods. The goods that are made in Kenya, the cakes that you make here in Kenya, should have such a standardization mark. The second one is the, um, is the diamond mark of quality. It is a mark of excellence. This one is not mandatory, but it gives you an advantage. It shows that your product has met the minimum standards and probably has even surpassed. So that one is, it is good for competition purposes. And then we have the third mark of quality. Mostly it's found in flour, uh, oil, uh, salt. It is, this one is issued in conjunction with the Ministry of Health and it is for all the fortified foods. These are foods that have extra minerals. We also have another department that is the market surveillance. Uh, this one just monitors and enforces the use of standardization and distinctive marks. So if you do not, if, you, if, you, if your products do not have our marks of quality or have not been tested in cabs and you take them to the market, we have a team that goes to the market to inspect if all products are complying to quality or are meeting the quality and they, they go randomly to any supermarket sample, they bring it to our labs, test. If it is not up to standard, then you're requested to recall. I'm sure you've seen our press releases most of the time, Naskia oils are not meeting the standards and stuff. So this is, that is the purpose of market surveillance. Now let's look at the standards and regulations in food sector. And here we are talking about the pastry. I'll be fast. We have the regulatory framework. Now it's important to note that the food industry has more than one regulators. It's not only CABS that regulates the food industry. We have other regulators. We'll talk about them in a few. Um, so it, this comprises of the laws, regulations, and standards. Uh, laws, I don't know if there are lawyers here, but my basic knowledge of laws um, especially on food laws, uh, it's, it's very important to know that the country does not have a single food law, but has several legislations that address food issues. And they include the Food, and, food Drugs and Chemical Substances Act, CAP 254 of the Laws of Kenya, that is implemented by the Ministry of Health. There is also the Public Health Act, CAP 242 of the Laws of Kenya, that is also implemented by the Ministry of Health. We have the Standards Act Cap 496 of the Laws of Kenya that is implemented by CABS. We have the Competition Act of 2010 uh, that is implemented by Competition Authority. We also have Agriculture and Food of Authority of uh, 2013 that is implemented by AFA. Uh, actually, but uh, there is a new bill that has been forwarded to the National Assembly to provide for coordination mechanism for all the agencies involved in food trade, including the devolved units of governance. So this is a new bill. It has not yet been passed into law. Um, so when, it's, when it will eventually be, be passed or not, if it will be passed, then we'll have a single authority regulating food. But as it is right now, we do not have one single authority. There was also a delightful presentation from Chef Faisal of Blue Band who was on hand to shed more light on the company's popular baking product, Blue Band Chroma. I'm here to talk about Blue Band Chroma, which is one of our baking margarine for a lot of our best experience bakers, high quality goods and great taste. It's a baking margarine, just to be able to specify. I've had a lot of people tell me that they used to have this in boarding school. How many of you had it in boarding school? Please put your hand up. Let's see, let's see, let's see. How many of you had it in boarding school? Isn't that a bit uh, something different that you're now learning that it's only for baking? 
<laughs> you should question your school at this point. So what I'm going to be discussing is how you can enhance your bakery creations with Blue Band Chroma. Because this is a made with rich, distinct and high quality ingredients. As Blue Band, we actually try and ensure that all our products are very high quality, good for you and good for your consumers. Because at the end of the day, a lot of people will just do a lot of different things to ensure a product can move. So one thing that we do have as um, Blue Band Chroma is, and this is something um, Wanjiko had mentioned, she had mentioned that if you need to get a cake mixer because you're realizing that you're doing so much effort in how you're producing your cakes or you're beating your butter and sugar together, we actually do have something for you because Blue Band Chroma is so well produced and so good in its content that you might not need actually to use a whisking machine. So as she said, as a baker, just start, begin somewhere. But um, as Teresa had also mentioned, she had mentioned that you need to get quality ingredients. Quality ingredients also entail that we have ensured that our product is good for your arms. So you will not use too much energy because you know you need to get your energy up all the time. It's good for your product and it continues to bring so much wholesomeness in your whole process. If you started with us and you're finishing with us or continuing with us forever, you'll realize that it only gets better and better. Some of the quality points that we boast about is Blue Band Chroma, the catering and baking margarine, is benefits of Blue Band Chroma medium fat spread, formulated with customer satisfaction at its core. Blue Band Chroma medium fat spread guarantees the following. Now, these are all points that we look for in terms of how you ensure that your products at the end of it all come out well. Because the only way you're, that you're going to continue to bake is if your customer basis is really thoroughly enjoying themselves at 100%. Now, the thing that we also boast about, and a lot of people don't know this, is that when you make um, a good crunchy product, our crunch remains, freshness is guaranteed, and the longevity of our products is key. Because you know, at the end of the day, some, someone can be able to order like, let's say, a thousand cookies. Then they call you back and tell you we only want 700, and you've already produced 1,000 cookies. What are you gonna do with 300 cookies? Are you going to just throw them away? Are you gonna give them away? But you're gonna need to find a way to make the sale, right? So our product will ensure that your product remains fresher, crunchier, and tastier for longer. It has a better taste, has a buttery flavor, uh, and aroma that gives the end product a richer, milkier, and creamier taste. Another part of the benefits of Blue Band Medium Fat Spread, it has no allergens, which has no soy lecithin or milk. So the best part about this is if you have a person who is lactose intolerant, if you have a person who has some sort of allergens that have to be able to be taken care of, you have no worries. You can make this for vegans and vegetarians and actually not have anybody come and sue you for trying to kill them or making them eat, you know, animals. Um, good creaming ability. Creams faster even without using a mixing machine. It's easier to achieve desired fluffiness. That saves time when using in baking cakes and cookies. So isn't that already a win? Because you know what? A win is a win, you guys. A win is a... A win is a what? A win. Thank you so much. <laughs>
we are yeah. looking out for offers yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah like chef has said today they have an offer so probably we will visit all those stands there and yeah. do the best yes mm -hmm. and also to Beldina what are some of the things that so far you've had to make the changes I, I see the hack for her is to check out for offers and also to shop in bulk what about for you uh, people are buying new properties yes kuna pesa so it is us to find these people who have these monies for example the other day actually as wanjiko has mentioned sometimes you have to increase uh, the cost the cost of the cakes the other day i introduced premium cakes each package is costing four thousand and can you believe me we have people who do, you tell them we have a kg for 2500 and another one for 4000 what is the difference i explain this one has this kind of feeling it has this this one doesn't have and like i want the best give me the one for 4000 mm -hmm. yeah so that tells you there is uh, money it's us to find that right market for our customers you position yourself let me ask you as to whether the situation is the same for you as well what are your hacks everybody has a birthday right yeah so you have to go out make sure everybody i tell people when you meet me in three minutes yeah. you have to know what i do for a living mm -hmm. you have to know that i'm a baker yes everybody introduces themselves i'm an engineer i'm a doctor i'm proudly a baker yes so don't be embarrassed about what you do mm -hmm. because if that's what feeds you, that's what pays your bills, mm -hmm. then be proud of what you do. Yeah. The other thing is I'm very big on diversity. Uh, for I've seen some of my students here. I do, I'm into value addition to dairy. Mm -hmm. How did I start? I actually went big on it when Corona hit. Mm -hmm. I was doing it before, mm -hmm. but I started being big on it when Corona hit yeah. because, okay, people are not having events anymore. So what can you offer? Everybody's at home, they are munching, they are drinking, they are eating. Yeah. So we started doing a lot of yogurt, a lot of ice cream. And I can say it's been an honor that I've trained more than a thousand people around the country. Yeah. And so, so many people are actually able to cross sell. 90% mm -hmm. of my students are bakers. And I've realized that if there's something that, will, that has really supported so many people, mm -hmm. especially when uh, the orders reduced is the diversity yes. because i when i'm training i tell people on cross selling yeah. and upselling cross selling basically is you're selling cake mm -hmm. when you call me you tell me i'd like to place an order yes. the first question i ask you i know you're actually ordering cake so i'm very sure of that but the first question i ask you are you ordering yogurt ice cream or cake do you know i'm asking you that because you probably don't know yeah. that we actually do yogurt and ice cream mm -hmm. so what happens is somebody tells you oh you also do yogurt and ice cream yes we do mm -hmm. so when you're delivering my cake yeah. please deliver with yogurt and ice cream yeah. so you find that you're able to sell several products mm -hmm. as opposed to if you just top it the client just wants a cake. So wow. I'm very big on diversity. Look for something that you can sell mm -hmm. together. It could be party supplies. Yes. Maybe you start selling things that, that are related to uh, cartoon and stuff like that. Well, being in this industry for some time, one of the challenges that I've found is increasing your prices. It is very easy to give an offer, a discount, to reduce a price, but going up is it's very hard. And with the economic state the way it is right now, with um, prices of ingredients going up, mm -hmm. we are also getting to a point whereby you need to increase those prices. And it is quite a challenge because the moment you tell someone that you're not selling your cake at this price now, you have gone to this price, mm -hmm. chances are you're going to lose some of those clients, not because maybe your, your quality is bad or so, but because of their purchasing power, and they may opt to go to look for someone else. But that is one of the challenges that uh, we're having right now, because you need to keep up. Because you find out, if you keep selling your cakes with the same prices that you've been selling, mm -hmm. your margins are quite low. Uh, this business you're doing, it's not just for selling cakes. Uh, no, sorry, it's not just for the sake of selling cakes. Mm -hmm. You're doing that business so that you can you know, better yourself up, you have bills to pay, you have maybe a child in school, you need mm -hmm. to pay school fees, you need to buy clothes for yourself, so you need some money. So if you're not increasing your prices, and when it comes to increasing your prices, you need to be very, uh, let me say creative about it, 
because you don't want to offend people, you don't want to push people away. But there are different ways that you can increase your prices. And one of them is by giving discount. Set a new price, but give a discount. Mm -hmm. So that they know when they are buying that uh, item, they know it is already discounted, but now they already have uh, this figure, which they know it is the new price. So once the discount is over, mm -hmm. going now to the new price, they have already, it is already in their mind. They already know that mm -hmm. the prices are going up and they won't have a big issue with that. Mm -hmm. Rather than just slapping them with a price mm -hmm. and uh, maybe something they were not expecting. Mm -hmm. With this engaging panel, the two-day conference came to a successful end. We would like to extend our gratitude to you for going through this video. We hope that there is at least one thing that stood out for you in all those presentations. Till next time, we wish you all the best in your endeavors.